by the Center for Social Justice, uh, the Greater Toronto Workers Assembly, and Socialist Projects. Uh, the Center for Social Justice is, um, it does research and talks like this around social justice issues, and it relies on charitable donations to do its work. So uh, please consider becoming a monthly donor. There's donor cards in the back uh, at the table, uh, or you can visit the website at socialjustice.org. And I uh, want to tell you that today's talk is the first in a series on ecological issues. Uh, it's called Capitalism versus Ecology. We need to change everything. Uh, of course, inspired by Naomi Klein's book. Um, and the talks will take place every three weeks on Sunday afternoons. Um, and we're very happy to start this series with Naomi Klein's book, uh, This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate. It's a very important and timely book giving us an opportunity to dig deeper uh, about the underlying causes of climate change and putting capitalism in the hot seat as the main engine of climate change and, and climate destruction around the world. Uh, and, also, and also to reflect on our own roles in our movements around climate justice and to be a bit more critical around that stuff as well. So here with us to help us unpack the book and these issues and also to talk about solutions uh, we have three speakers, Sam Gindin on the, on the far end, uh, Patricia Perkins, and Umer Mohammed. And we'll start with Umer. Um, he's a PhD student in political science at York University. His research focuses on the political economy of the environment. And I'll hand it over to Umer. Hi, everyone. Uh, okay, so this is a bit, I have to hold the mic and do the thing. Actually, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. It's fine. I have to hold it up higher. It's high uh, higher? This is high. Okay. All right. So, um, we're all here to talk about Naomi Klein's new book. So, this is, this is an important book, um, and there's a lot to be said about it. I want to focus on two main themes, um, and that's, um, first of all, the book provides a great overall and relatively comprehensive account of uh, the crisis of climate change, as well as the organizing and activism related to that crisis. Uh, and second, the book is important because it gives voice to the most progressive section of the environmental movement. And this is really useful because we have to know what this section of the movement stands for, um, what its political outlook is, uh, if we're going to engage with it in a meaningful way. So, just briefly, I'm going to touch on the account of climate, climate change that's presented in the book. Um, and so first, the facts that, that are, are presented. Uh, and Klein relies on, she cites uh, Bill McKibben's famous account that I'm sure many people are familiar with, um, with you know, the amount of carbon that can safely be released into the atmosphere versus the amount of carbon we have in uh, reserve. And the amount we have in reserve is about five times more than we can safely emit uh, in the next several decades. So um, the famous figures are that the total amount of global carbon deposits are valued at around $27 trillion, um, and more than $20 trillion of that um, should be considered stranded from the point of view of you know, ensuring that the Earth uh, has a stable climate. Um, and so these assets can't be extracted and burned. Um, but as Klein notes, from the standpoint of our social system, uh, these assets are going to be extracted and burned. Uh, so as far as, as capitalism is concerned, the health of the biosphere uh, doesn't matter. Things are going to keep moving forward as if climate change doesn't exist. Um, and this is a, you know, a, a pattern, you know, things move forward uh, and, and we pretend as if poverty doesn't exist and, you know, injustice in other forms doesn't exist. Um, and so the, this is one of the major uh, set of facts about climate change uh, that are, that's kind of that the book hinges on. 
And I want to turn to the second issue I pointed to, and that's the uh, politics in the book. Um, and I want to relate it to the larger movement. So it's clear that an important section of the environmental movement has been drifting into uh, anti-capitalism, or what it, you know, what people in that section of the movement recognize as anti-capitalism. Um, so, but it isn't always clear uh, what they're talking about, and you know, it's not a completely coherent kind of anti-capitalism. Um, and it's often it's it's just something that seems to be very fashionable at the moment, um, and so people will include anti-capitalism as part of a long list of labels that they attach to themselves, along with anti-racism, anti-sexism, etc. And it's done in a somewhat tokenistic way. And I don't think I don't want to say that the book is in any way uh, tokenistic in that in that way. Um, it certainly isn't. Uh, it's quite a bit more uh, substantive. Um, I mean, it has its issues of, of coherence, but uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if I want to focus on that. I I, I want to look at um, the wider movement. And so, since anti-capitalism is a terrain that socialists happen to be familiar with, we as socialists, and I'm just going to assume that everyone here. Is a socialist. <laughs> Let's have a vote. <laughs> it's just in my totalitarian nature. Uh, so as as socialists, we have to we have to make a concerted effort uh, to bring our interpretation to the discussion on the environment because, uh, especially because I mean we would have to anyway, but especially as now more than ever, there is this discussion of anti-capitalism. Um, on the other hand, um, I think many socialists involved uh, and, and who are active in environmental activism, um, they often find, and I myself often find, that I have to be kind of hush-hush about my socialism, right? You kind of have to put that aside while you're organizing the folks. Um, and I want to ask the following question. Uh, what does it look like uh, to have an unapologetic and constructive uh, socialist engagement with environmentalism. Um, and I'm not really going to be able to answer this question, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, in any kind of fully fleshed out way. Um, but I want to put that question uh, out because I think it's really important. And I want to tr start trying to deal with it. And I want to do that with the help of uh, Edward Said. Uh, since we're here at Bates Atun, I think that's, uh, you know, I thought maybe I'd try to be a bit relevant. Um, and so uh, Edward Said has this famous essay, I'm sure some of you have read, called Permission to Narrate. Um, it's, in the essay, he has a lengthy discussion about uh, Noam Chomsky's book on, what's the book's title again? Yes, The Fateful Triangle, thank you. I knew someone would know. <laughs> so, of course, uh, Said praises Chomsky and the book, um, and, but he has uh, two criticisms. And um, the first criticism is the one that most people remember. Um, and it, it's about how Chomsky doesn't really use very many Palestinian sources. Um, the second criticism, which I think is a much more noteworthy, is about uh, facts. Um, and about the nature of facts uh, and their importance in, uh, in political struggle. And so Said says that while Chomsky's command over the facts is unrivaled, um, no one else has, you know, knows the facts, can detail the facts, um, compare them like Chomsky does. But, he says, that facts aren't enough. Um, that facts are always embedded in history and they are always perceived through people's moral and political horizons. And I think that's a really important point from this, you know, just thinking about uh, politics in general, but especially in relation to the environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, because the facts about climate change are urgent and radical. And, of course, they're important for us to know, 
and they're important for us to communicate to people. But this doesn't mean that relating them to people is automatically going to result in people becoming radical. Um, and because this is because people take the facts about climate change, you know, into they take them in um, based on the kind of moral and political horizon they have. And often enough, we find very disturbing. We find that uh, after hearing the facts uh, about, you know, after coming to terms with them, people will uh, adopt rather than radical views, they'll they would adopt reactionary views or you know very mainstream views at sometimes. Um, and I, and to some people, so and actually, some, to some people in the environmental movement, that's the kind of that's the form you know anti-capitalism takes. Uh, it it sometimes takes the you know it's it's a so it'll happen that anti-capitalism means that we should wait around for capitalism to collapse, and then we can build a local primitive society and you know in its place. Um, and to some, it means that you know it's even more extreme in, in, that, in that kind of direction. It means that humanity needs to become extinct because we're the ones destroying the environment, and that we're a plague on the earth. And then you know evolution can take its course, and and um, and then to to many others, I mean the, the the facts about climate change mean that you know Harper needs to be kicked out of power, and that we need to adopt an energy regime that Germany has, or something like that, right? Um, so it all depends on how far and in which direction people's uh, political horizons stretch. Um, and this, I think, is where we need to engage with the movement. Um, it's, of course, not over the facts, but how to, first of all, how, how to position our uh, our moral and political compass. Um, and that has to happen, um, it can't happen, I think, with just the environment. And I think Naomi Klein does a great job of, you know, of pointing out that it's not just a matter of the environment, we have to think about it in terms of social justice. Because so often the environmental issues get kind of uh, taken, um, and then it becomes about um, and then it, that's really where the misanthropy can come in and lead things in a scary direction. Um, and I think that's part, partly the constructive way of doing it is really important. I, um, and so even many of the people who have uh, terrifying and reactionary views uh, uh, you know, on the environment and, and what the solutions are, they're people who are uh, out there raising awareness about it and spending a lot of time, you know, and energy into this. So, so we have to be kind of respectful of that um, and and engage in a constructive way. Uh, and and I think uh, Naomi Klein's book helps us engage in a constructive discussion because it uh, it pushes the environmental movement to a, to kind of you know stretch its uh, political horizon in a progressive direction. Um, and that, I think, is something we can then uh, help to kind of, as socialists, maybe push in an even more critical direction, if possible. And, and for that reason alone, I think uh, the, the book is worth celebrating. Um, and probably there are many others, but... Uh, so. <laughs>